I'll get the door. Liam, what are you doing here? Where's Terence? Is he with you? Let me in quickly. I don't want to see her. Let me in. What's after happening, Liam? What is it, Liam? Terence is after being arrested. They came into the city hall and arrested him. This is the third time they've arrested him. Blast him. Where did they take him? We don't know. Some of the lads are checking around the city. We'll find out soon enough. Was anyone else arrested, Liam? I don't know. I'm not fully sure. Don't worry. We'll soon find him. Where is going back to sleep? Did I hear right, Liam? They've arrested Terence. Again. What are you doing about it? We can't do anything until we find out where they're keeping him. Typical. You'll send your backside to us too late. I'll find out where he is. Hold your wish, Danny. You can't go wandering the streets at this hour of the night. We'll let the boys handle it for now and in the morning we'll do our own thing and get the girls up to come and organised. What? They can't wrestle our mayor. Mary, you get a message to me when you find out where he is. Hannah, you know what to do. I'll round up some of the girls and start making up some placards, and I'll organise transport if we have to travel. The British will be everywhere. We have to be careful. No loose stop around. Come on, we've work to do. The trial of Mr. Terence McSweeney is now in session, and the judges in this plenary session are Lieutenant Colonel A. H. C. James, DSO, NVO, and President of this court. Present. Captain Brevet Major, A. E. Percival, Essex Regiment. Present. Captain E. C. Reeves, Hampshire Regiment. Present. Captain Gover, you are the prosecuting counsel, is that correct? That is correct, Your Honour. Bring the prisoner in. Do you object to be tried by me as president or by any of the officers whose names you've read over? I object to the whole court as being an illegal court and not assembled by the Irish Republic. Objection overruled. I swear to conduct. I swear, I swear to, to conduct. conduct. The proceedings of this court. The proceedings, the proceedings of this court. In a truthful and impartial manner. In a, in a truthful, truthful and impartial manner. manner. As laid down by military disciplines. As, as laid, laid down, down by military, military disciplines. disciplines. First charged, the accused, Terence Maxweeney, a civilian of Cork, is charged with, without lawful authority or excuse, having in his possession a cipher contrary to regulation Second 22A. Charged, without lawful authority, or excuse having under his control a cipher contrary to Regulation 22A of the Defence of the Realm Having in his possession without lawful authority or excuse a document containing statements, the publication of which would be likely to cause disaffection to his fourth charge. Majesty, having in his possession without lawful authority or excuse a document containing statements, the publication of which would be likely to cause disaffection to his majesty in contravention of Regulation 27 of the Defence of the Realm Regulations. Call Regimental Sergeant Major S.W. Bailey. What happened on August 12, 1920? 
On August the 12th, 1920, I was warrant officer in charge of the detention barracks Cork. I recognised the accused, the civilian, as having been brought into the barracks that night. He gave his name to me as Terence McSweeney. It is my duty to make charge of the effects of prisoners. I asked him to hand over the chain which he was wearing and he refused saying it was, it was his badge of office of Lord Mayor of Cork. On Thursday night, 12th of August 1920, I was on duty under Captain Fowle. We went to the City Hall. I saw three men whom I was on guarding, tearing off papers and throwing it onto the ground. I recognised the accused as one of the men tearing off papers. On my return, Private Norris gave me two letters which I gave to Captain Fowle, who was just beside me. I recognised the envelope produced as one of the letters, i.e. the one marked A and signed by Private Norris. I recognised Mr. Max Sweeney as one of the 11 men. As far as I remember, the envelope was closed when I got it, but I cannot swear to this. The document I produced was exactly as it is now. I knew it was a cipher, but did not know what cipher it was. I arrested the accused now in court and took him with others to Victoria Barracks. I produced the fence of the realm manual containing official copy containing on page 577 proclamation suspending in Ireland the right to trial by jury. I produced the termination of the competent military authority made under regulation 56 of the defence of the realm regulations. This prosecution is now closed. The court is now closed for consideration of the finding. Do you wish to address the court? The proceedings of this court are illegal. You will shortly have to realise that the Irish Republic exists. The officers of the court, though deputed by higher authority, share in the illegality of the court and anything which may happen to me. The fate of my predecessor, who was murdered by the government, made me aware of my danger when I assumed office and the members of the court and all concerned will be responsible for whatever happens to me. No charge was made against me in connection with what I said about the murder of Lord Mayor McCurtain, and this is a proof of the guilt of the government. I realise that I may meet the same fate as Mr McCurtain. I had regarded soldiers as men of honour, and as a soldier of the Irish Republic, I had respected them. But Lieutenant Coe has committed perjury, for the code was not in my desk, though I know where it was, and I am sure it was put at my desk. The two documents, the code and the message, were together, but have been separated. As Chief Magistrate of Cork, this cipher should be in my possession, and therefore, on his own admission, the officer of the police is indicted for being in possession of this cipher. I have said all I want to say now, and repeat the words contained in this speech, part of which forms the fourth charge. Our first duty is to answer that threat in the only fitting manner by showing ourselves unterrified, cool and inflexible for the fulfilment of our chief purpose, the establishment of the independence and integrity of our court, the peace and happiness of the Irish Republic. To that end, I am here. Facing our enemy, we must declare an attitude simply. We see in their regime a thing of evil incarnate. With it, there can be no parley, any more than there can be a truce with the powers of hell. This is our simple resolution. We ask for no mercy and we will make no compromise. I accept the responsibility for the control of the documents which have been produced and no one else is responsible for them. I have decided that I should be free, alive or dead in a month, as I will take no food for the period of my sentence. The court sentenced the accused Terence McSweeney, civilian, to be imprisoned without hard labour for a period of two years, signed this 16th day of August 1920. Take the prisoner away. This court martial has now ended.
That won't cure the problem, as long as Max Wynn is in head of a trouble of sight. I've been told that the Prime Minister wants him shifted off to England. The sooner that happens, the better as far as I'm concerned. Has he taken any aid? Just water and nothing else. He won't keep that up for long. Just get rid of the crowd outside the gates, will you? I don't care how you do it, just do it. Yes, sir. Come on, get up, get dressed, come on. What bloody time is it? It's still dark. What are you up to? Never mind, just do what you're told. Come on, come on, we haven't got all day here, move it. What's your hurry? Where are you taking? Come on, you'll find out soon enough. What about my stuff? Never mind then, they'll follow you later. I'm Terence McSweeney's wife, Muriel. I come to see my husband, and these are Mary Nanny's two sisters. Mr. McSweeney's wife. Follow me. Follow me. Come in. Mr. McSweeney's wife and her sisters are here looking for him, sir. What will I tell them? Do they suspect anything? I don't think so, sir. Well, they're going to find out sooner or later. Bring them in. Yes, sir. Wait, I want two guards inside here and two stations outside the door. I want them armed. Do it now. Yes, sir. Come in. Miss McSweeney, sir. Show her in. <laughs> Sit down, please. Miss McSweeney is no longer here. We have shifted him for his own safety. What? You've shifted him? Safety, my eye. What have you done to him? Where is he? Shh, Mary, it's all right. Where is he now? He's been in Brixton prison in a couple of hours. Brixton? Brixton prison? That's in England. My God, what have you done? You blasted cowards. How dare you? You can't do it. It's not right. You're not an old English lackey. Your day will come, Mark. My words, your day will come. English lackeys, the lot of you. Get them out of here. Get them out of my sight. day his life ebbed away until finally he gave his life for his country. That endurance, what he endured, I think, served as an inspiration to the people of Ireland who were then in the middle of a war of independence and it steeled them to face the trials and tribulations that still lay ahead. After his death, Terence's remains lay in Southwark Cathedral in London. Thousands gathered outside the cathedral as it was removed to start its journey back to Ireland. The British authorities felt that the journey to Cork would create too many emotions. So the body was brought to Cork by sea. 